Fine. I'm very excited to welcome you today uh, to our guest lecture, which is a part of our celebratory inaugural festivities that are taking place this week. It has been exciting in so many different ways to be deeply grounded in this work and this mission that we do here at Nevada State. Uh, yesterday, we heard from the WHO, uh, our students who represent the new majority, who talked about their lived experiences here at Nevada State, what brought them to the pathway of this institution, and then more importantly, what they need from us in order to be successful. Today, we want to talk about the why. Um, we want to be able to delve deeper into why this work is so important. Uh, what is the moral imperative, uh, perhaps the economic and the socioeconomic imperative of this moment for the students that we heard about yesterday? And our dynamic and brilliant speaker uh, is here to make the case. Uh, so you know when you come into a new space, there are lots of opportunities to meet so many uh, people. Uh, and I've had a glorious journey of making my way through the valley, meeting people. Uh, but one person who has quickly come to be one of my favorite humans uh, is our speaker today. So when we talked about uh, this particular event, asking her to serve in this capacity became quickly something we knew we wanted to have happen if she was available. Uh, I've heard her speak both passionately and meaningfully in public and in private about the issues of the new majority and important in, in that uh, personal experience that she brings to that work, as well as thinking deeply about how we as a society and as a community come together to address this work. Uh, her credentials go wide and far. She said, don't, don't go spend a lot of time on that because it's taken away from her time to talk. But I, I believe when someone has uh, done some work uh, that is their credibility in terms of how they could stand here. Uh, she is currently the executive director for the Elaine P. Wynn and Family Foundation, a foundation that supports a variety of nonprofits and education entities locally and nationally. Uh, prior to that role, she worked for uh, Nevada Energy as a vice president for employee and community engagement, and then also at MGM as a senior vice president for corporate diversity and community affairs. I could think of no one uh, more suited to offer today's comments. So without further ado, please welcome my friend and someone who I think is going to be a hero for me, uh, Ms. Puna Mather. Thank you. I hugged her because I'm boosted and I'm vaxxed and I'm signed up for shingles and uh, I've taken Benadryl today. Hi, 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 hi. Um, that was like a three on the Richter scale. Hi. hi. Thank you. And to all of you watching from desks and dorms and any cars, wherever you are, um, I'm better looking in three dimensional. That's all <laughs> I will say to you about that. Um, let me just give you a standing ovation, Nevada State, as you come upon your 20th birthday. So, yo, and I, was, I, I wasn't at the kitchen table with that group of really enlightened white guys that some 20 plus years ago were imagining and dreaming of the possibility of you, but I was there to watch those enlightened white guys take meaningful, decisive, all-in steps to give birth to you. It may be the only time throughout the course of history that a group of white men have given birth successfully, but thank goodness it happened here. Uh, 20, you're still not able to drink yet, however. So context matters, right? I have been giddy with excitement at coming to spend time. In fact, see, I even dressed the part, right? Yeah. Um, and here's the thing is the, the president challenged me very simply by saying, the student panel yesterday is going to be about the who. Any of you that were there, holy moly, I have carried those four human beings with me for these last 24 hours. I would be honored, absolutely honored, to either live next door to one, to work with or for one, and I'm going to be really honored to vote for one. That's what I saw. And what was so illuminating to me is that as I watched the four, they were stunning in how impressive they were. And they were typical in how impressive they were. So I just 
put that as a post-it note on my soul because that's the stuff that you do when you're as old as I am. You put post-it notes on your soul. Um, so in, in, in trying to approach uh, how do you make a case, I go to the thing that I have done professionally for many years, which is to become a car salesman. Let me give you the it, dices, slices, purees. Would morning or afternoon be better for you? Can I deliver it? Do you want to come pick it up? And I thought, that's nuts. And here's why I think it's nuts. How many of you have been in this community more than 3.7 days? Raise your hands. Welcome home. Because the average length of stay in this community is something less than four days. So if you've been here longer than four days, welcome home. And as I welcome you home, I'm going to then give you the t-shirt that says, welcome to the home team. So whatever you bring, wherever you bring it from, whatever experiences represent the absolute spectacular nature of you, welcome home, welcome to the home team, we need you. And I'm not going to spend any time showing you charts and graphs that show you the numbers and the trends. So here's what I decided I would do, is I want to share with you, I've been here I love this 20 because it's nice round numbers. I can do easy math. So you're 20. I've been here about 40 and I'm a little over 60. So I don't know why I think that's so cool, but how elegant is all of that, right? I'm not a math person. I just like patterns, I guess. So as I reflected, I want to suggest that we collectively zoom out as a predicate to zoom in. And I say as a predicate to zoom in because the zooming in needs to be with precision needs to be exact, needs to achieve excellence. So we don't get the best two out of three on the zoom in. You get one shot at 2022. You get one shot in January. You get one shot with an inaugural address. You get one shot to do this year. That's it. So let's make sure that the precision in the zoom in, the execution, the implementation is as close to excellence as we can achieve. And one way to help guide that is to zoom out. So I want to zoom out, sit in your armchair, Arms behind your head. I don't mean literally because that would be weird. Um, but let me just share with you some of the things that I'm going to pull from my memory deck in the 40 years, twice as long as you've been alive. Um, so in the 1990s, President Pollard mentioned that I worked in the gaming industry, and I did. I was a senior officer for MGM Resorts at the time with 11 convenient locations to serve you and 75,000 employees. Um, those were, I'm going to just dub them the go-go years. Anyone here during that decade of the 90s? The go-go years. Everything was go, 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 go. We were boomtown. We were on the cover of Time and Newsweek. We were on the top of all the fastest growing, quickest to do this. We were on the top of every one of those lists. And all of that thrust was a single engine, a single economic engine, and that was the service sector. Well, that's awkward. Um, if you don't have your phone on vibrate, <laughs> I am really honored and totally embarrassed to set the example of why it would be a good idea. <laughs> um, yep, that's just the way it goes. So go-go years, boom town, service sector, single engine. We talked about economic diversification. We did. Didn't matter. It just didn't matter. And I'll, specifically, I'll share with you that prior to going to the gaming industry, I was senior vice president of the local chamber of commerce. And at the chamber, your job is to promote business. And economic development, diversification was a topic. And we nailed the big one. And the big one that we nailed was a back office credit card processing facility that was going to create a brand new home at the lakes. And here's how tough it was. First, they wouldn't accept the Las Vegas address. So we designated just their little plot of land as a new city in Las Vegas called The Lakes, Nevada. So that credit card payments would not be coming to Las Vegas, they'd be coming to The Lakes. You do what you can to, to diversify. So we did it. It was going to transfer, relocate from Salinas, California. California's loss, our gain, we're diversifying our economy. I was dispatched as a senior VP of the chamber to go and try to talk to the employees who are now going to be faced with the choice to move to Las Vegas, and they were not real open or receptive to moving to Sin City with their families. So I spent a week in Salinas, California. Everything that happened at that credit card processing facility in Salinas, California, I realized the week I was there was an above the fold report in the daily newspaper. And yet, the arrival of them into Las Vegas was barely a brief in the business section. Mm 
So does that make sense? Of course it does. Because if the single engine thrust that you're looking for is driven by the service sector, you can talk about economic diversification all day long, but the truth is to land something as big a deal as a national company with 300 employees didn't rise to even a huh when you compared it with the fact that Bellagio was going to open and employ 10,000 people. And then let me talk about, so I was in the gaming industry. I worked for MGM Resorts when we opened Bellagio. The hiring, here's how hiring from Bellagio went. At the Mirage, we opened the employment office. We knew that to hire 10,000, we were going to want to talk to 100,000, because that's kind of how it worked. And here was the first filter of qualification in the economy that was working so well for us. When you entered that set of portables behind the Mirage to apply for a job at Bellagio, the first person you encountered was a person who simply stuck out their hand and said, hi, welcome. And what the majority of folks never understood is that that moment, that interaction became the first level of qualification for success at Bellagio. If you didn't have eye contact, if you didn't shake my hand robustly, strongly, and with presence, the fact that you went to the window meant nothing. You were not going to get a job at Bellagio. So I offer that because education, the what I knew, was simply not a determinant of my economic mobility. It was simply not a determinant, or not the sole determinant, of my level of success. I'm oversimplifying to make the point, right? And so it didn't confuse me. It was understandable that we as a community had this anti-intellectual legacy, and in fact, a sense of pride about it. High school dropouts could make $100,000 parking cars. How many of us have heard that? It isn't actually really true, but I will tell you that working in the gaming industry during the go-go years, which was the economy, did not ever require proof of a high school diploma, did not involved big curiosity about where you went to school, what you learned, what your experiences were. It didn't. First level of qualification, handshake, service sector, eye contact, you're in, and you could go on and be very successful. So all of our systems in our state responded to the needs of the economy. That's kind of how states work, right? The single biggest determinant of the well-being of a state is how it is doing economically, because that's the boat we're all in. That's what creates opportunities. That's what creates sustainability. That's what creates people to want to go there. It is all about the economy. So in the go-go years, it makes sense. We had an economy that was single engine, all service. Education was not a determinant. And every system in our state responded. And what do I mean by that? The Clark County School District during the 90s was a construction management company. That's what they had to do. That's what the economy needed. And guess what? The district delivered. Higher education delivered. We don't need to grow and expand to meet and challenge what's happening in the economy. We can just catch those who opt out of that primary economy and want something different. Every system responded. So it makes sense to me why we're here. So that's sort of one flyover observation I want to share. Second one, and this was a moment for me that changed. It was a, I was watching someone be very prescient. It subsequently became, I think, our zeitgeist. It was in the mid 1990s. I was at the Mirage Hotel. I'd just gone to work in the industry for Stephen Elaine Wynn. Bill Gates is going to be delivering a keynote address. Steve says, would you like to go? I'm like, yes, please. He's speaking to an assembly of the nation's governors. And I don't remember the exact topic, but essentially what he was trying to do is to help them be effective leaders and help them think longer term. And the one story that he told that was gobsmacking I don't know if that's an academic term or a corporate term, maybe it's a mommy term. It gobsmacked me. And here was the story that he told. He said, one way to look at it is that considering airplanes from the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk to the advent of the jet plane in this country took all of our imagination and innovation and took 40 years. And in Bill Gates's story, he likened that to a doubling in aeronautic technological capability. 
Wright Brothers to jet plane, he called it, dubbed it, concluded that as a doubling in, in, tech, in technological capability, and it took 40 years. In the mid-1990s, Bill said, Bill Gates, listen to me calling him Bill like I know him, <laughs> Mr. Gates, Mr. Gates said to the group of our nation's governors, that doubling in technological capability is today occurring every 15 to 18 months. It gobsmacked me, and I didn't have the foggiest idea why. I knew it was big, but I didn't at the moment comprehend just how big. And yet, in subsequent years, as I learned and contemplated the fact that so much of the American dream is anchored or was anchored in the notion that I achieve whatever educational terminus I achieve. And when I'm at the terminus, it's going to launch me into the appropriate layer of the American dream. So a terminus prepares me to be successful for the next 30 years of my life. It is the American dream. It is not coincidental, I don't think, that mortgages are timed to that. So the American dream was I pursue education to whatever terminus I declare. That terminus launches me into the level of economic mobility that will allow me to be effective, sustainable, and achieve the great American dream for my whole life. I will pay my last mortgage payment, I will have my retirement party, I will get a gold watch, and then I will go fishing. It's captured in normal Norman Rockwell portraits. That's how deeply ingrained. But then I thought about my buddy Bill. And I'm like, hang on, <laughs> hang on. What is an educational terminus? What he was describing was information and technology not what I can do consistently. It is what I can do with agility. Not what is going to be true for 30 years, because 85% of jobs that we will perform five years from now haven't been invented. That makes sense if technology is doubling in its capability every 15 to 18 months. I offer that because it's not just a thing to think about anymore. We have both of our feet fully planted in the middle of the age of knowledge. That is where we are. We are no longer in an agrarian society where it is the work of our hands. And yet it is a bit baffling that we still take three months off school to go and harvest the fields that were now way back then. Our systems are often slow to catch up. We're no longer in the industrial age where everything is built. We build our babies like we build our Buicks. Get on the assembly line at age specific. Time is the constant. Mastery is the variable. You spit out at the terminus. That all worked when it was Buicks we were building. But the world in which we live today, fueled by technology and its amazing exponential speed of change, what it requires of us to be successful isn't the consistency of our hands. It isn't time being the constant and knowledge being the variable. It is all knowledge. I am only gonna be successful anymore because I have agility. I have curiosity, I solve problems, I am inquisitive, I go sign up to learn the next thing I need to learn so that I can be relevant for the today I'm living in. Our systems haven't yet caught up. But I think of Bill Gates when I hear those kinds of things. It is not surprising that as companies, as institutions, and frankly, as leaders in a community on the home team, we need to get obsessed about this stuff. It's not just, a, a, it's, not, it's no longer enough to say, oh, I get it. And I certainly am, ain't going to get in the way of it. Leadership today demands insistence around these set of issues, requires an obsession around these set of issues. How do we create humans and conditions and cultures in which all humans can be agile, visible, heard, have their potential expressed? I don't know the answers, but I know that you're asking a lot of the right questions. 
So that's one. Well, two. So go, go, Bill Gates. The third thing I want to reflect on is how as a human trait, the one thing that always gets our attention is pain. It's been true of, my, of me in my own life. Nothing gets my attention like pain. And as a community with our single thrust economy, we felt pain. We felt it deeply after 9-11. We felt it deeply after the recession, the Great Recession of 2008. And I gotta tell you, I think we've just been feeling it pretty deeply through COVID of 2020, 2021. So what does that do? Here's what I've seen over the last decade is economic diversification has always been something we talked about. It was when six of us were excited that 300 employees were coming from Salinas, but it didn't really matter to our economic future. Following all that we've gone through, pain gets our attention. What we've now absolutely come to know is that a single thrust engine ain't going to launch us into the future. And that single thrust being the service sector definitely ain't going to give us competitive advantage or even competitive relevance in the knowledge age, right? So pain has gotten our attention. It has humbled us. It has caused us to look eyes wide open and confront some pretty precise and often painful truths. We ain't set to be wildly successful in the knowledge age. So 10 years ago, 10 years ago, I watched Governor Sandoval say, economic diversification matters for real. So if I'm gonna pursue something, the first thing I need is some organizational construct that gives me a fighting chance. He spent a couple of legislative sessions redesigning our economic development team as a state. Important, check. We did that a decade ago. Subsequently, he said, once we've got organizational structure ready to go. Now we got to figure out what it is that we want to hit as bullseyes. And good for us, we have seven industry clusters. We have enumerated seven of them. Two, we know, gaming. You don't abandon the thing that you do best. That's important. Mining, don't abandon the thing you do second best. But there are five others. And let me give you, just remind you what the five are. You all know them, I suspect. Health and medical business IT ecosystems, clean energy, logistics and operations, aerospace and defense. I'm not particularly smart, but that sounds like a whole lot of knowledge needs to go into that stuff. So here's where we sit. 10 years ago, we made right moves. Thanks to leadership. It takes one to declare it. And we had a governor, Governor Sandoval, that declared it and then was willing to do what it took to get us out of the driveway. Thank goodness we've got in Governor Sisolak, a business guy who says doubling down there. Now the opportunity is how fast can our systems catch up? And I don't know the answer, but I know I'm talking to the home, to home team that's going to lay that answer down for the state. So as we're zooming out, and I want to just reflect on our community. So we're all here. Is there a bottle of water anywhere? Or someone who can wipe their bottle off and give it to me? I'm not proud. I'm a mother. I've got very, I'm very easy. Ready. Come on. I dare you. I dare you. I dare. It'll roll. Will it pop? Thank you. Well, who are you? Oh, of course you are. Of course you are. Um, I'm going to get better at trying to recognize people with masks on, but I'm not still not good. Okay, so let's reflect. I want to zoom out and just reflect on the community, the community that is our collective home. Uh, whether you've been here for only slightly more than four days or six months or 50 years. Um, in the 40 years that I've been here, this community has exploded. It is fourfold the size it was when I came here 40 years ago. Fourfold. It's almost hard for me to conceive of how fast and big that is. But let me tell you how fast and big that is. This community for the last four decades has been either one, two, or three on the list of the fastest growing communities in this nation for the entire four decades. So if it feels fast, newsflash, it's been fast. If it feels big, newsflash, it's been big. And the only thing that has exceeded the pace and rate of growth of us 
is the pace and rate of growth of the diversity among us. Why? The service sector was the magnet. Service sector did not rely on educational attainment for success. Who responded to that magnet? The best, hardworking, dedicated, motivated around the American dream group of folks possible. Welcome home. So that's who we are. Every system in our state is lagging because it's really hard to maintain pace when the pace of change is as blistering as it's been around us, right? But we got to up our game. I got to put fuel in the octane. Otherwise, the game's going to be over before I get on the field, right? And the lost opportunity and the lack of ability to grab hold of the success that is ours to claim seems to be a price that none of us want to pay, right? So let's not. Um, I want to tell you a story. So 20 years, roughly 20 years ago, I love this 20, 40, 60. Um, I am 61, by the way, so I have to round it down to make the thing work. I'm going to give you enough time to process fully the entire thought, dang, she looks good. <laughs> I am not above being pathetic. Um, so 20 years ago, I was a diversity diva of MGM Resort, 75,000 uh, employees, 11 convenient locations to serve you. And we were talk, spent a lot of time talking about minority, minority segments, minority markets, minority people, minority, minority, minority. And yet every trend line that I saw concluded incontrovertibly that we were absolutely going to minority majority. Now, I'm not that bright, but there's something really convoluted about a term that is minority majority. Like, what's that even mean? So not only have our systems not caught up, neither has our nomenclature. Our lexicon got a little, little work to do itself. So 20 years ago at MGM, we said, we're gonna change how we talk about this. This isn't about minority anything, because minority something conveys something less than the big. And yet what we're talking about is a reality and conditions in our society where it is the vibrancy of our diversity that is the normal. So we started to focus on emerging markets, privately traded company. So this wasn't about doing right by brown folks. This was about earning the business and building a relationship with brown folks. That's what it became, because the color in a private sector company that mattered the most was green. Make sense? OK. Um, but I'm going to tell you a story about a philosopher who is mine. Um, and this is a personal story. So I've got four children um, who are adopted. So Destiny introduced us to the state of Nevada's foster system, and we don't match. And so I, when I became licensed, I was licensed for two, and social workers begin to call and pitch their kid or their file, actually. And so I took in, uh, at the time, nine-year-old Richard, and I need to visually introduce you to them. So Richard, now 32, at the time he was nine, has a shock of blonde hair and blue eyes, sometimes green eyes, depending on what he's wearing. So he looks like he stepped off the streets of London. That's my boy. He's nine. The very next day, because I had two slots, in bounced little baby Joseph, a fairly light-complected African-American boy who looks a little now at 23 like Barack Obama. It's in the ears. They both stick out. Um, so they arrive. And so I've got Richard and Joseph. Joseph's adoption happened very quickly within a year. So that second slot became available. So my favorite social worker called and said, I think I met, I think I met your daughter. Cool call to receive. So the suggestion is that I should go and introduce myself to a five month old baby girl. I don't know about you, but I wanted to impress the social worker, whatever she says I'm gonna do. So there we go. I've got Richard, I've got Joseph. And off we go. And Joseph is at the time like weeks old, right? But we're gonna go, or he was a year old. So we go to have our interview with our five month, five and a half month old baby girl. And as we're driving back, I say to Richard, let me describe how families work. Richard, they're not always constructs of biology, but they are always commitments. It's all it's it's not biology, it's commitment. So tonight, I want you to go to sleep 
And I want you to contemplate whether you can make a commitment to being her big brother forever. And I will go to sleep and see if I can commit to being her mom forever. And if the answer is yes, then we will go get her tomorrow. And I actually gave myself, self-scoring, some pretty good parenting score there, right? Pretty good. And then, of course, I proceeded, like a lot of parents, um, to not listen to my own advice. And I tossed and turned all night, and I just really did not feel good in the morning when I woke up. And there was a bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, blonde-haired, blue-eyed kid sitting at the table. My daughter, Tay, now 22, is a fairly dark-complected African-American uh, beauty. Um, so Richard's got vibrancy. So I say to him, so what do you think? And he simply said, you know, she's got my eyes because my daughter Tay has got hazel or light colored eyes. Spectacular. She's got my eyes. She's got Joseph's curly hair, a reference to the Afro that those two shared in common. And she's about your skin color. I think she'd be a perfect fit in our family. <laughs> so sometimes the tensions of population changes are difficult, as would be the potential to add new and random members to a family potentially be difficult. But what it begins with always is the simplicity that my little philosopher provided me. They're sure, the complexity, the challenges, they're going to be there. But ultimately, it's about depth and strength of commitment. And that's simple. It's not complicated. And so I reflect on Richard's wisdom a lot when we start to talk about things around diversity and emerging segments or minority segments or this group or that group. I'm like, welcome home, man. Welcome home. And you're a perfect fit in our family. And now we just got to get the family to make sure that the promise of a perfect fit is the thing that we deliver as frequently and as reliably as we can. So today, markets have emerged. I don't know what the new language should be, but it shouldn't be for me about minority anything anymore. Because it, even that suggests something that groups and gaggles people with some erroneous belief that therefore you're all the same. It doesn't make sense to me. To say that the African, to say that the black segment is a segment is to make this conclusion that therefore there's homogeneity within the segment. It's not there. The thing that is the most spectacular about us as a community is the richness of our diversity. And it's not about segments. It's about people, individual people, right? Um, and so the markets have emerged. New majority is the term that we're using. There's got to be a better term because the new majority still sort of is too tight to what didn't make sense. And so we tend to want to tweak to make work what actually fundamentally doesn't work. So I don't know what it is, but that's why you're in higher ed and I'm not, and I'm on the home team and you'll figure it out. Um, so what's the challenge for all of us, right? We're on the home team. Economic diversification is a absolute real deal pursuit. Our state's ability to meet that moment and to claim any degree of success around our future is gonna be wholly a function of whether we can prepare a workforce and how quickly we can prepare that workforce for the knowledge economy in which we are living that is changing at the speed of sound. Like that's the challenge, right? Is how can we quickly claim what I'm gonna call a superpower that is our diversity, not this thing we need to put up with, not this thing that we need to manage, but a superpower. How do we claim our superpower and use that superpower to accelerate our economic success, to kick the tail of other states in landing the big knowledge-based companies. How do we do that? That's what we should be answering and seeking to answer every day. Um, the aspiration then is outward mobility is, is a promise that 
we've got to strive to keep 100% of the time with 100% of people. And in the MGM resorts days, there was one uh, sort of perspective that served us really well, and we carried it to 75,000. And let me share it with you, and I think a lot of you know this. Um, but oh well, there's a tribe named the Ubuntu in Africa, and they have a way of interacting with one another when they encounter each other. Very simply, two members bump into one another, I say salabona, two words, salabona, very literally translates into I see you. The response is sikona, single word, sikona, equally literally translates into therefore I am here. What you have done that I have watched with great pride and hope and enthusiasm is delivered salabona out of a higher ed institution known for an ivory tower that could only see the few. How dare you? <laughs> and keep doing it. Nepantla. Yesterday, one of the students mentioned seventh cohort. I think I heard seventh cohort. I was here when it was some group of 20, you were probably there that day, digging through couch cushions because you've got a great run with presidents whose last names begin with a P, but the former President P said, we will do Nepantla. There was no other higher ed institution in the country digging through couch cushions to figure out how to pay for it, to seek forgiveness if necessary, to do the right thing. You did it. You got seven cohorts or maybe more. And what do we know about Nepantla? What we know is when you say Salabona and really authentically mean it, you unleash the ubiquitous potential that existed in that human being and has always been there, just never been seen. We heard it from the students yesterday. And what, what I was so struck by is not a one of them said, the policies and the procedures at Nevada State really work for me. Not a one. Not a one, but you know what every one of them did? They named specific humans, faculty members, advisors, other students. They named human beings. And what that conveyed to me is there's a whole lot of Sawabona and Sakona happening up here in Scorpion country. Is it Scorpion country? Sounds weird, okay. Sounds like a dangerous place, but <laughs> I don't know. But that's what I heard from the students yesterday. What I heard from the students yesterday was clearly those four students had received or perceived full permission to be vulnerable. Two of them talked about anxiety, depression. All four of them talked about being hermit crabs before they discovered the permissions that this community here granted them. Whether you did it explicitly or not, it matters. Because, yeah, it, um, because, uh, you know, what, it, what is incontrovertible to me is that human potential is ubiquitous. What is equally incontrovertible to me is that opportunity is simply not. And we got a heck of a long way to go. And let me now move to that, to the set of the observations about the headwinds. What is going to get in our way? Because the faster I can acknowledge it, stop minimizing it, stop avoiding it, stop hoping it goes away, the faster we can solve it, right? There's nothing we can't solve when we put our minds to it. But let's get, you know, it, there, we've got some big headwinds and let me just share with you a few of the ones that sort of are true for me. Um, zoom out, we are in a nation, as a home team, we're in a nation where we have a really uh, sick, historical relationship in enslaving and brutalizing Native Americans and African Americans. And that history is baked into the bricks of our nation's foundation. That's complicated. I wasn't here then, but I know that there are vestiges of that generational legacy that flow through me. I know that. I certainly can see it in all the institutions, it makes sense why it's there. 
But then the question for all of us is what are we willing to do about it? So those are headwinds. They are strong. Um, Yeah, there's, I mean, I can go on and on about that one, because that just, I think back to the, the Emancipation Declaration, right, which is 159 years ago. Um, since then, tallying up just a few, 13th Amendment, 14th Amendment, 15th Amendment, civil, rate, civil rights acts over and over and over again, Fair Housing Act, anti-discrimination policies, enactment against hate crimes, and on and on it goes. Not one of those promises has been kept with fidelity in our nation. It's a headwind. It's a headwind. And so that discomfort, let's share it. Let's acknowledge it and let's experience it. Because the only way to heal is to go through that first phase of acknowledgement, acceptance, and then a willingness to move forward. So that's a big deal. Systems, another headwind is systems are, by their very definition, built maintained and perpetuated by those who have been in power. So I'm not judging it, I'm just observing it. So if we agree that as a nation, opportunity is the thing that has not been presented equally, then there's disproportionality in who's running stuff. And if there's disproportionality in who's running stuff, no matter how well-intentioned those folks are, they're still only capable of doing what they've always done, based on what they've always known. And so I love the vulnerability and the willingness around here. I heard it yesterday. One of the students said, I would love to increase student voice. And, and what I did not perceive from those in the audience was, oh, Lordy, I wish you hadn't said that. Instead, I perceived a whole bunch of you doing this. Keep doing that. Because we can get through the headwinds, begins with acknowledging them and then a willingness to keep moving through them. Um, and I think the third thing, so we have a convoluted history that is simply a part of our past, doesn't need to be the singular determinant of our future. We have systems that we can all acknowledge have been constructed, perpetuated, maintained to deliver exactly what they've been built to, de to deliver, still being run by the folks that have always run them. So power sharing needs to be a really important part of the conversation and then the willingness to do that. It's one thing for me to say, I will share power. It's a whole other thing for me to trust you and actually let go of it. It ups our game, though. It ups our game. And then the third thing that I think is always a headwind, um, certainly it has been for me in my own life, is none of us are as good as we think we are. And I was humbled through COVID. I know it was, a, I think for most of us, it was a period of deep reflection because time was plentiful when you were sitting locked up. Um, and I thought I was pretty... Uh, I thought I got it. I was a diversity diva, led the company to top companies for diversity in America. I raised this brilliantly diverse family. I'm like, I got this. You ask your questions, I will be your answer woman. But as I watched the murder of George Floyd, something in me said, oh, not so. And I will tell you that I was raised in Canada, where we did not have a whole bunch of teacher time spent on here is American history relative to its relationship with African Americans. Talk to me about Hudson's Bay. I got that in history class, but I didn't get US history. So even though I've been in this country for 40 years, even though I thought I was awake and open-minded and sort of living values that I believe to be really deeply important, what George Floyd taught me is how little I knew. Because I could not believe that the place in which I was living and a place in which I view myself as a steward of the place I'm living, that on my watch that happened. And it was humbling because I thought, wow, it caused me, it actually inspired me, um, 
although I'm not sure that shame is the right word for, that translates to inspiration, but it prompted action. The pain got my attention. And so I loved that there are, it turns out a whole lot of books written. <laughs> Who knew? It turned out that Netflix had their Black Lives series. Fascinating. I am a very different human being today. And I will tell you that part of that the humiliation that came with the recognition that none of us are as good as we think we are, especially not this one, especially not on this topic, was the amend and the apology that um, finally gave me some relief when I expressed it to my two black children. So none of us are as good as we think we are. And so the ability to create space within a culture, within a family, an institution, an enterprise, the willingness to say, you can be ugly here. You can be uncomfortable here. You can keep evolving and growing here because that's what we all do. But what you cannot do here is not do any of A, B, or C. What you cannot, what will not be permissible here anymore is to operate like you got this. Because none of us got this. All of us are at different stages in getting it. What I want is peeps around me, on my tribe, on the home team, that operate with a deep and respectful awareness of that. To say, just because you don't have it in this minute and what you said was really hurtful, I'm not gonna cut and run from you because I am compelled to do my part to help you be better. And now you do your part for you to be better. Imagine what we could create quickly in our families, in our social circles, in our institutions, in our enterprises, in our state, in our world. If we could simply grant that permission and give pranky promises and collect pranky promises to hold us all to that accountable standard. So Team Nevada State, happy 20 years, but you can't drink yet. <laughs> <laughs> so what I've seen is, um, I love the ocean. It is for me the, um, a spiritual place. And there's also great physics at the ocean that I, it remind me a lot of great lessons about science. And I love watching like sets of waves. I don't know how that all works. It's really awesome. All of a sudden, there's big sets of waves. You get a set of waves that's got a few really big ones. And what is inevitable about every one of those waves is that it will beach eventually. And so for me in life, now with six decades of reflection and experiences to look back at, I know that at any moment in my life, I am on some wave. And I'm here to tell you, Nevada State, that you are on a wave. It is the biggest one in the big set at a time when the, ec the economic future of our state is simply a function of how vigorously, imaginatively, and excellently we can answer the question, this is what being prepared for the knowledge economy looks like. This is your time. Every minute that you've spent, and Tony was reminding me that scrappy enlightened white guys, well enlightened white guys gave birth then there was a whole bunch of scrappy folks who were here with a couple of scorpions in the middle of the desert that just through sheer will delivered and launched an institution that was against all odds you've always been against all odds that's just how you've been then came the great recession 2008 oh here you go maybe you recalled it there was discussions at the state to say how do we break it up and slide it into other stuff not on your watch, that didn't happen. Here you are, seven cohorts in Nepatma. Diversity is a value around here, not a thing you do. I can feel it, right? The, the accountability around all these issues related to diversity, inclusion, equity, the accountability ain't in the metrics, it's in the BSometer. And that thing is this flawless gauge that my late father reminded me that all of us as human beings have it installed. It lives somewhere in here. And he called it a BSometer. And it is that infallible ability that we have as human beings to know exactly what just happened in the interaction between you and me. I know when I'm being judged. I know when you're hearing me. I know when you're seeing me. I know when your salabona is sincere and authentic. I know when you're being vulnerable, I can feel your courage. I can feel your pain. 
that's all in the BSometer. And what I've always really admired about what you've created out here is that you tend to operate with values as the driver and a BSometer as your measure of accountability. So this wave is the big one in the big set. This moment in our history is a seminal moment. We will either show the world how to harness, how to harness our superpower, which is our diversity, to leverage it to lay claim to the economy of the future. So that's the opportunity. The only other part of that is to answer the how long is it going to take us? So I will leave you finally with zoom out periodically. I just think it's healthy as a way to zoom in to then be precise in execution and implementation. Be driven by your values. Values aren't things that I change from Monday to Tuesday or one semester to the next. Values are things that define who I am. And when I'm operating with values and being propelled to do amazing things with excellence, that, my friends, is also what creates our legacies. So as a member of this community, I want to thank you for showing how it can be done. I want to challenge you to accelerate to do even more, even faster, even bigger and love each other like crazy through it, because that's what I know you do. So be bold, be great, be state, and be fast. <laughs> and I think we've got two minutes for questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Now one minute for questions. It better be fast and it better be good. Questions, comments? <laughs> Who said that? Nick. Go Nick. <laughs> Go Nick. And I will just say leadership is everything. Everything. And there it is. You have everything. And leadership is not always by virtue of position. It is always by virtue of choice. So leader leaders she's making the choice and she has a position i just want to inspire and compel and beg each of you to every morning in that mirror when you see that gorgeous face looking back you make that choice to be a leader and i'm rooting for you on the sidelines all of you i'm rooting for you so i don't know about you but i left tremendously inspired uh, by your comments and I think I could think of no better way of amplifying this idea of who we serve with these questions of why. Uh, and this idea that at the end of the day, Nevada State matters, not only just for the individual students we serve, but for this economy and for this region. Thank you for painting the why for us so thoughtfully and so eloquently as always. Thank you so much. So and, and I have one, but before I give it back to you, I love just I, 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 we just have a I small present on I behalf of Nevada State to you. Just so some things that can populate your desk and inspire you. Oh, what's that? And then the socks. Socks. And then next place for all you, great, the great book that you'll write. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I love presents. Um, the one other thing that I'm going to say, and I probably wouldn't repeat this, is do you remember when Harry met Sally? Okay, there was a scene in the film in a restaurant. Ends with, I'll have what she's having. All right. We've observed that systems are slow to catch up. But there's always got to be a leader. You have already demonstrated that. Two decades you've spent. And here's the opportunity that is a byproduct of your excellence, and that is, I'll have what they're having. Thank you all. Have a great rest of your afternoon. I look forward to seeing you tomorrow.